uh, my uh, paper on the Madhyamaka trick had its roots in an earlier paper that appeared in the Svatandrika Prasangika distinction. And when I was working on that paper, uh, I came across the passage in the Prasanna Pada where Chandrakirti accuses an unidentified interlocutor of being a logician, a tarkika, he uses the word tarkika, who, quote, uh, in the, my translation of the Sanskrit, takes the side of the Madhyamaka out of a desire to show off his mastery of the science of logic, unquote. Chandrakirti's words, as I read them, raised several important questions. Uh, first of all, what does he mean uh, by tarkika? What exactly is the nature of the distinction that he wants to make here between a tarkika and a madhyamaka? Uh, for whatever that distinction may be, it seems to me, it is clearly central in some sense to Chandrakirti's understanding of Nagarjuna. But uh, there is another, I feel, equally striking point to be made in this context. The distinction Chandrakirti is making here is not simply about the difference between a logician and a madhyamaka. He is also saying something important about two different ways of reading a text. So no matter how we resolve questions about the use of logic or reason or argumentation, there is, I believe, a more basic methodological issue here that can't be avoided. It seems to me that Chandrakirti is saying that the lens through which we read Nagarjuna will determine in fundamentally important respects just how we understand the Madhyamaka Karaka and his other works. So, there is an implicit question in all of this, a question that goes to the heart of every effort to understand the Madhyamaka, namely, how do we decide what lens is appropriate? How do we approach the text? And I take this to be the basic conundrum of hermeneutics. How do we decide how best to go about trying to interpret a text when any eventual interpretation of that text is so deeply implicated in this very decision? Or put slightly different terms, we cannot justify the lens through which we read on the basis of our interpretation of the text, and yet we must. And so any difference that we may express over the use of logic or reason or argumentation is therefore an expression in some real sense of a difference in values. Or perhaps even more provocatively, it occurred to me, of a difference in where we place our trust, which struck me very uh, as strange that this might all come down to an issue of trust. In any case, for Chandrakirti, this was obviously no small thing. Whatever else it may have meant to him, the difference between a Tarkika and a Madhyamaka is only one aspect of something even more fundamental, something that must be resolved before we can even begin reading the text. So, uh, having said that as a kind of precursor to, I want to make a few specific remarks before my time runs out here uh, on some specific concerns relevant to our discussion today and on these two papers. Um, I was reading through the abstract of Jay's paper as it appeared in the Journal of Indian Philosophy and uh, in that abstract where he kind of sums up what he was about in his paper, he, he uh, writes, Huntington argues that Madhyamakas reject reasoning, distrust logic, and do not offer arguments. He also argues that interpreters ought to recuse themselves from argument in order to be faithful to these texts. Um, so, question occurs, I think. Why would I imagine, uh, set aside the question of whether or not I'm arguing, for the moment at least, that the Madhyamakas reject reasoning and distrust logic. There are, of course, uh, the comments of Nagarjuna, the notorious comments David mentioned uh, last night in his talk. Uh, I have no proposition, no pratijana, I have no position, paksha, or view, drishti. Uh, and then there is uh, Chandrakirti's distinction that I just drew attention to between a tarkika and a Madhyamaka. Um, and then there is the whole debate, such as it is, between Svatantrika and Prasangika, which is so often framed as a discussion about logic. Uh, again, as David uh, mentioned in his talk last night, uh, the biggest insult is to call Madhyamaka a Tarkik. So, like Jay, I want to find a way to understand Madhyamaka that does justice to such language. And I believe we both agree that this is a subtle undertaking uh, in the language of the Upanishads, walking the razor's edge. So, let me take a couple of minutes to look at the word argument. Jay says that I argue that Madhyamakas do not offer arguments. 
and he finds, as he writes in his paper, at least it looks to me like Chandrakirti argues. So are these arguments or not? Here's a question that I think might help get at this issue. Is there only one way of thinking about the word argument? Is there only one way of understanding what it means, that word, to argue, uh, how an argument works? Uh, let me give a few examples to illustrate why I think this question is relevant. Let's take case one. A lawyer makes an argument before the court in the town of Northampton, Massachusetts. Last time I came here to give a paper, an hour before I was supposed to uh, give the paper, I. I uh, was turning out of a parking lot here, and a car took a left turn quickly in front of me, and I smashed into the car and totaled the car, and it was an undercover state trooper's car. <laughs> but I came out and gave my paper, and, and, uh, uh, but anyway, so this example of a lawyer making an argument for the town of Northampton, uh, this, this strikes to the core. One kind of use of the word argument. Uh, let me take another uh, example of how the word argument can be used, or thought about, let's say. Atticus Finch makes an argument before the town court of Maycam, Alabama, in the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. Both of these cases, I think, may fit the dictionary definition of argument, but A, my example A, uh, the real argument, you might say, before the town court of uh, Northampton, seems to be quite different from the fictional argument presented by Atticus Finch in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Although the fictional argument looks very much like real argument, it does not operate in the same way at all. Let me take one final example of a context in which we might use the word argument. I'm dreaming. I realize I'm dreaming. I see others in my dream, and I try to convince them that we're all in a dream. I actually did this. I had a dream. Um, I had a dream uh, where I realized it was a dream, a lucid dream, and uh, I've been reading about Tibetan lucid dream practice and things. And, in my, and I was so excited uh, that I was actually knowing I was dreaming, I was having a lucid dream. And there were three people off in a corner of a room uh, about this size uh, in the dream, and I ran over to the three people and I said, this is a dream. And they did not believe me. Uh, so. Notice, uh, if the argument, if my argument in the dream were to be successful, it proves that it's not a real argument uh, in the sense of I defined real a moment ago, the lawyer arguing in the court of Northampton. Um, and its effects, whatever they are, of this unreal argument, uh, are also called into question in some strange way uh, because they're also of the nature of a dream. So my point here is that the word argument could be said to have several distinct meanings depending on the context in which we use the word. So Jay is correct uh, that I do not find any real arguments in the Madhyamaka. However, I do not deny that the Madhyamaka offers the appearance of arguments similar to arguments in fiction or in a dream. So the question becomes here, how exactly does a fictional argument operate? How should we read it? And the answer I proposed in the paper uh, was that we read it the way we read a trompe l'oeil painting. And if I just take one moment here, I hope my time situation is okay, uh, to read a, a paragraph from the, from the paper where I use this example of a trompe l'oeil. Even though a trompe l'oeil is meant to deceive and in some way, in some cases very nearly succeeds, it is not always accepted at once as a reality. At first sight, the image comes as a surprise. By it turns, it inspires doubt and certainty and a continual readjustment of the gaze. The puzzled viewer is torn between the message of his eyes and the message of his brain. The mind may already know the right answer, and yet the spectator's reaction is to abandon his receptive passiveness and act in order to test what he sees. A relation of uncertainty is thus created between the image and the viewer. In fact, a fictional argument only appears as if it leads to firm, rational conclusion, something we can know for sure, guilty or not guilty. Thus, I never claim, uh, well, I might say, in fact, a fictional argument is neither 
in this sense rational nor irrational. Thus, I never claim in my paper, as Jay repeatedly uh, asserts, that Chandrakirti is an irrationalist. Um, in any case, I, appear, I do agree with Jay that Chandrakirti's arguments appear to be rational. A fictional argument, however, leads to no real conclusion. Rather, like a Trump Lowell painting, and this was my point in the article, a fictional argument is meant to deceive, but not completely, for even its deception is not a real deception. Uh, again, let me read just a few lines from uh, 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 How to View a Trump Lowell Painting. When, at a subsequent moment, the mystification becomes certain and unmistakable, is the picture to be rejected? It is at this point that one begins to realize what is meant by the strange and well-defined world of a Trump Lowell. And so, uh, we may say in this respect, I believe, that a fictional argument creates a relation of uncertainty. This was a, a phrase that seemed to characterize what I was getting at here. Um, this is how, it seems to me, uh, the Madhyamaka's arguments operate. Uh, this, for example, is how I read a passage from the Prasanna Pada, where Chandrakirti writes, and here I'll quote my Sanskrit translation, uh, translation from the Sanskrit, there could be certainty if there were some possibility of uncertainty as its opposite. When we do not allow for any real uncertainty, however, then in the absence of its opposite, how could there be certainty? Such language, it seems to me, is designed to make us question our very desire to know. As I suggest in my paper, again borrowing from the Lankavatara Sutra, it is language designed to conjure up a world that is neither as it appears nor otherwise. This is the language of Samrati Satya. This is the language of Upaya. This is the language of fiction. This is the language of dream. It is the language that Jay calls real argument. So, I want to close, and I'm sure my time is uh, almost up, with a few personal thoughts on the symposium. As a scholar specializing in early Indian Madhyamaka, I've grown accustomed to thinking of myself as a kind of intellectual historian, someone who deals with the past, not with the present. And indeed, we're accustomed to saying that the Indian Buddhist tradition died out in India sometime around the 12th century. But whatever stand we take on the issues raised in the symposium, it's amply clear that the conversation did not begin with Jay and me. We are simply perpetuating a lively discussion that goes back some 1,500 years to the very beginnings of Madhyamaka. And that we should feel, as all of us here clearly do, that there are so much at stake in this particular conversation suggests to me that the Indian Buddhist tradition is far from dead and gone. Nagarjuna, Buddha Palita, Dignaga, Dharmakirti, Baba Viveka, Chandrakirti. In some sense, this is our lineage. And the problems that troubled them are the very same problems with which we're wrestling here today in Northampton. But any solutions we propose, for better or worse, will be our own. And this is as it should be. This is just fine. Thank you, Andy, thank you, Sarah, and Jay, uh, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>